Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. I'm Eve Engler coming to you. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone, everyone is doing well. This is the coming to you from uh, Georgiage, uh, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. And this is about the 75th, 80th uh, uh, weekly session of the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, which is a weekly critical look at Canada's role uh, internationally. And um, I hope everyone is uh, uh, enjoying the fall weather. Um, so I think I'll get right to it. Many developments uh, in Canadian foreign policy. Uh, today's Globe and Mail has a story titled Morocco Desperately Needs More Nurses. Canada is hiring them away and talking about how basically Canada is uh, poaching uh, nurses from Morocco, particularly Quebec and New Brunswick, and how that's uh, contributing to the uh, problem with uh, lack of uh, nurses uh, there, which is a much greater problem. We have a problem here, but much greater problem there. And the, the article goes into some... Uh, some of uh, what's being done in other jurisdictions that uh, alleviates the sort of brain drain from, from the uh, more impoverished uh, uh, countries. Uh, uh, La Presse had a story a couple of days ago titled Le Canada continue d'exporter ses déchets plastiques. So can Canada continues to export its uh, plastic waste uh, in Myanmar. And this is an issue that's been going on for quite a while and the Canadian government was very slow to sign the uh, treaty around uh, uh, the export of waste. It was a big uh, kerfuffle, a controversy over waste that Canada was exporting to the Philippines a few years ago and that put some pressure on the Trudeau government to finally sign on to the treaty uh, but apparently there's still quite a bit of Canadian waste that's finding its way, uh, in this case, to, uh, to Myanmar. Um, and uh, this whole business is sort of using the global south or impoverished countries as our like kind of waste um, uh, storage or waste uh, uh, bin, if you like. The Montreal Gazette had a story a couple of days ago titled PQ, Parti Québécois, says sovereign Quebec will have own currency army. So that, uh, uh, Quebec would have an army, they say it will be mostly focused on peacekeeping, which reminds me of the fact that how much Quebec nationalism has uh, succumbed to the, to the foreign policy order. So that's going back uh, even before the 1980 referendum, uh, then 95, where the Parti Québécois said they would stay in, in, um, in NATO, uh, would stay in NORAD. And as we're seeing in recent days, I think a lot of the Quebec nationalism has actually gone into very right-wing territory and we're kind of a little bit against the historical um, uh, pattern on Palestine. So what we're seeing from the Bloc Québécois, and I'll get to that in more detail later on, but what we're seeing from the Bloc Québécois um, is uh, Yves-François Blanchet, the leader, is actually kind of like deriding, they're very derisive towards the NDP's positions, which are clearly not good enough, but are a step better than the Liberals. And not a single Bloc Québécois MP signed on to the statement that, that uh, 33 MPs uh, signed on to calling for a ceasefire. Um, so Quebec nationalism you know, there's a little bit within uh, uh, Quebec Solidaire that's a little bit sort of seemingly critical, ostensibly question NATO. But what we've seen there also on the on the proxy war in Ukraine is very much in alignment with um, with official uh, uh, NATO uh, uh, policy. So the pan the pan 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 Panamanian government uh, yesterday, the day before. Uh, uh, agreed to a new contract at the Cobra mine, huge mine that's run by First Quantum, which I, I believe is Vancouver-based. might be Toronto, but I'm pretty sure it's Vancouver-based. Uh, and, uh, and it's really controversial. It's a top, it's a top 
issue in, in, in Panamanian politics is big demonstrations, road blockades and last, last little bit uh, over the issue. And the Canadian government, Canadian officials have been have been promoting uh, First Quantum's interests in, in Panam Panama for, for many years. The OECD, there was a story in the Globe and Mail about um, uh, titled Anti-Bribery Enforcement Lacking, OECD. And basically, it talks about how Canada's uh, 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 anti-bribery legislation is very weak. And that's that's been an issue for a long time. And into the nineteen into the nineties, it was legal. It, it was you, uh, you. It was legal to bribe officials uh, abroad. And and um, the uh, one of the heads of uh, SNC Lavalin before it became SNC, it was SNC and then and then Lavalin. Um, boasted how he actually could get a tax uh, deduction for his for the bribes the company engaged in internationally so for many years canada was was very much uh considered a, a, a laggard on anti-corruption uh legislation internationally now there was a bit of controversy about that about it maybe a decade ago and the harper government improved legislation but according to oecd uh it's it's seriously lacking in in its um how it's being uh, administered and as the report noted this is particularly important because uh is a, is a quote a serious concern especially in view of the size of the canadian economy and the industrial sector sectors in which canadian companies operate uh which represent high corruption risks specifically of course the extractive sector right so this very permissive uh, 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 legal environment around foreign bribery is particularly something that mining companies um, uh, exploit uh, that are operating in, in this country. A UN panel of experts uh, concluded that Michel Martelly, the Haitian president that Canada helped impose in 2010, that he created, helped create, fund, and arm gangs in order to, quote, advance his political agenda. So this is something that people in Haiti have been saying, obviously, for many years. And this is a, a, a UN panel of experts that really details it out and confirms what's been widely uh, speculated uh, for, for many years. And as one Haitian uh, 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 Quebecer, uh, pointed out uh, when this this UN expert panel was released a couple of days ago. Simultaneously, Ariel Henry, the successor of Michel Martelly, who was uh, a minister in Martelly's uh, uh, government, and the PHTK regime that Martelly began, still runs effectively runs Haiti. Um, that Ariel Henry was in Ottawa. Being, uh, being hugged by uh, Justin Trudeau um, at the same time as the UN was saying that uh, uh, Trudeau, uh, sorry, Martelly was the founder of the armed gang B257, which was used to pr protect his regime. Uh, so now this report, this UN report on Martelli's role in helping fund and create these gangs in Haiti is, of course, quite should be quite embarrassing uh, at the moment because the foreign intervention that Canada was pushing at this UN summit, or sorry, this this uh, CARICOM summit that took place in Ottawa on Wednesday and Thursday of last week, what Canada was doing in large part was trying to promote. Um, the Car CARICOM countries to join this UN mission that Kenya is now uh, uh, going to be leading in Haiti, which is supposed to be about fighting the gangs. So we helped install uh, an individual the UN is saying was helped create the gangs in Haiti and was using them for his political purposes. And now we need a new foreign intervention in Haiti to deal with the gang problem that the politicians we've been backing for a long time now. Uh, have been very important in, in, in creating uh, that problem of gangs. Uh, nonetheless, that is what is, is, uh, is transpiring. 
And I did, a, I did an interview with uh, uh, Tamanisha John, who's an expert on the Caribbean. I just posted it to my YouTube and, and the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute YouTube, uh, where we go, we talk about the summit and a bit about what was discussed beyond just Haiti and the broader history of uh, Canada's role in the Caribbean, not just about Haiti, but, but actually uh, mostly we talk about the, the former British colonies and how much influence Canada's had in those English speaking uh, 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 colonies. If people wanna check that out, they can. The Financial Times had a story titled Five Eyes Spy Chiefs Warn Big Tech Over Beijing Threat. And according to this story, this is either the first time or one of the first times that the heads of the, spy, the Five Eyes, so the head of the FBI, the head of CSIS, um, and the British, Australian, New Zealand uh, equivalents, they were in in uh, Silicon Valley, in uh, you know uh, in in uh, California, uh, near San Francisco, um, and they were meeting with big tech, um, uh, tech companies to basically warn them about China's spying and the like, um, and. Uh, I'm not. We don't. I don't know much more about what they what they were exactly saying, but they were hyping up the the Chinese uh, uh, threat. Today, uh, Melanie Jolie released a statement on Twitter and uh, a press release that talked about how I think they called it a spam jam that apparently a dozen or I forget the exact number, maybe it was a bit more than that. Uh, Canadian MPs, including the Prime Minister, have been targeted by this this media uh, assault from a Chinese associated uh, uh, um, social media uh, uh, account that has a sort of like fake news, uh, uh, sort of uh, de demonizing these Canadian uh, politicians. Um, it seems to me like it's more of this, this hyping the China threat, um, but, uh, there was, I just saw the press release a couple hours ago. I haven't seen more about it than that. Um, but apparently, according to the government, uh, Canadian MPs are being targeted by these, these, uh, these social media attacks or social media disinformation campaigns that are, are being uh, instigated by, by China uh, or Chinese-associated uh, entities. The, I think it was Bloomberg has a piece about the uh, a number of media outlets reported on this, uh, I think beginning last Monday, I think I might've mentioned it last week, but uh, throughout the week, they reported on the a Chinese uh, fighter jet coming close to a Canadian uh, spy uh, plane uh, operating near Chinese uh, um, airspace. And, uh, there apparently, I think there was also some American uh, uh, jets that were were sort of um, targeted, and and apparently the Chinese jet came too close for comfort, uh, so so it got a bit of media attention. Now, what was I thought was interesting in this Bloomberg story is this is this is a repeat of of um, the same kind of false description that's been going on now for a couple of years about Canadian fighter uh, patrol aircraft, naval vessels uh, patrolling near Chinese territorial waters, airspace, uh, and, and, and North Korea, the so-called Operation Neon. And what Bloomberg said is that, quote, Canada said the 13-member crew of the plane involved in the incident Monday was part of a UN mission aimed at enforcing sanctions against North Korea to encourage the nation to end its nuclear weapons program. Now, that's that formulation has been repeated many, many times. And, and it's, it's, the Canadian government is not lying. That formulation is, is simply incorrect. There is no UN mission. There, what there is are UN sanctions against North Korea. There is no UN mission to enforce those sanctions. So Canada, the US, uh, Japan, I believe, uh, sometimes the French or British have taken it upon themselves to do that. And the media repeatedly frames this as a UN force, even though it, it absolutely is not. The Canadian government, if you look at their language, 
They strongly imply it's a UN force, but they don't they don't st- uh, come outright and lie about it. Uh, but they they um, they clearly are, are are more than comfortable with the media uh, 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 dis- distorting exactly um, the specifics around that. There was a story titled Canada to assist Philippines tracking illegal fishing. So Canada, Canada is going to, Ottawa is going to support with satellite technology uh, to, to help the Philippines with illegal fishing, which is not about illegal fishing. It's about China and the territorial waters dispute between China and the Philippines. And these claims that China is Chinese associated entities are involved in illegal fishing in waters that are disputed between the countries and that Philippines claims. And so Canada is going to be assisting the Philippines. And this is, of course, is all associated with the US uh, recent agreement to get more bases. I think it's in four more bases in the Philippines, uh, which is largely about uh, uh, targeting uh, uh, China. There was a story uh, with not a lot of detail about how Canada, quote, imposes Russia-related sanctions on Moldovan individuals' TV stations. So Canada is sanctioning some of the opposition in Moldova that's viewed as uh, 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 pro-Moscow. And on the question of the NATO proxy war, the former head of uh, Germany, Schroeder, Gerard, I believe is the first name, uh, but that's not prop, proper German pronunciation. But uh, he, he, according to um, the University of Ottawa professor Ivan uh, Katnotsky, uh, Schroeder confirms the revelations by ex-Israeli prime minister and Ukrainian media uh, around the negotiations in March of 22, quote, at the peace negotiations in Istanbul, in Istanbul in March 2022 with Rustam Umarov, the Ukrainians did not agree on peace because they were not allowed to. This is what Schroeder said. And then Schroeder says that they basically had to ask the Americans if they could agree. And as people probably remember, there was agreement in principle to end the, the uh, Russian invasion. And uh, it had to do with NATO, you know, not joining NATO, and um, pr- princi- principally, and and uh, basically, the British and the Americans scuttled it. And this is further confirmation. Naftali Bennett, the former Israeli Prime Minister, <clears throat> the Turkish Foreign Minister, Ukrainian media, and others have already uh, uh, stated that. And now, uh, Schroeder, who was involved in the process and actually met with Putin on the issue, Schroeder says. Um, in this interview that that is being uh, quoted here, um, he confirms this these details. So so uh, I think we're getting pretty close to a, a certainty on that on that front that there was something approaching uh, an accord that could have not not stopped the invasion, which had already happened, but the incredible destruction that we've seen uh, so far or subsequently, <clears throat> it, it would have either stopped it or greatly lessened it. Um, if that deal would have been done back in March and April of uh, of last year, the Washington Post had a story today that's titled "Ukrainian Spies with Deep Ties to CIA Wage Shadow War Against Russia," and the story goes into basically uh, how the CIA rebuilt the or built the. Ukrainian intelligence apparatus after Yanukovych was ousted in 2014. And from the story says, quote, since 2015, the CIA has spent tens of millions of dollars to transform Ukraine's Soviet formed services into potent allies against against Moscow, officials say. The agency has provided Ukraine with advanced surveillance systems, trained recruits at sites in Ukraine, as well as, as well as the United States, built up new headquarters for departments in Ukraine's military intelligence agency, and shared intelligence on a scale that would have been unimaginable before Russia's, Russia illegally annexed Crimea and fom- fomented a separatist war in eastern Ukraine. So 
this is just another piece to this business of, of Washington, Canada, Britain, turning Ukraine into a bulwark uh, against Russia. And this is going into just how, in, how involved the CIA was. I would almost guarantee you that Canada was involved in some way in assisting that. Uh, certainly, we know with uh, Canada's intelligence sharing at that time uh, uh, that uh, was agreed to back in 2015, the radar sat that Canada uh, gave uh, uh, um, uh, for a number of years to, uh, to uh, the Ukrainians. Um, so, so this, yeah, this is further adding to that, um, that um, uh, uh, political dynamic that's um, important uh, in understanding the horrible war that's going on uh, uh, today. The Canada Files published a couple pieces this week uh, to do with the Ukrainian the sort of fallout from the Nazi gate. One is titled uh, Bandera Glorifying Flyers Handed Out by Counter Protesters <clears throat> of Toronto Rally, Toronto Rally Against NATO Proxy War. Another one was titled UCC, Ukrainian Canadian Congress, Toronto Event Honoring of Nazi SS Division, attended by MP Ivan Baker. Uh, CAF Canadian Forces and Canadian Forces members. Um, and so this is more uh, about just how deep the sort of uh, pro SS kind of thinking is among the Ukrainian Canadian Congress and their circles. And Ivan Baker, the MP, refused, he never, he's never, uh, he hasn't publicly uh, criticized uh, Yaroslav. A hunka coming to parliament and being <clears throat> given a standing ovation. So these pieces go into a bit more, you know, flesh out uh, more of what we know about how how aligned uh, or how deeply associated the Ukrainian Canadian Congress is with the with the former uh, Galicia division of the of the uh, SS. And on that front, um, uh, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, based in Alberta. Uh, a Communist Party guy, he posted a, a, uh, a passage uh, from the longest serving leader of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, uh, Wassil Krishnir. This is, I guess, he was back in the 1940s. And a passage of what he said. He said, quote, the greatest man at the present moment is Adolf Hitler. He has changed the map of Europe and united all the Germans in one state who were formerly under Austria and the Czechs. Together with Mussolini, he has resisted the Bolshevist invasion of Europe, stepped on the necks of the Bolsheviks in Spain. Um, so this is apparently the longest serving head of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, who was a pretty clear uh, uh, supporter of, uh, of Hitler. And uh, of course, that was a different time, uh, but the remnants of some of that political ideology seems to be uh, still quite prevalent among the uh, Ukrainian Canadian Congress and have, of course, seeped into uh, Canadian uh, policy on, on, um, on Russia, on Ukraine, on the proxy war. So the New York Times published a piece I think on Monday or Tuesday, that is basically about how Zelensky is concerned that the fighting in uh, the war, the onslaught, the genocidal policies uh, against Gaza and obviously also the West Bank, that, that that's uh, taking the world's gaze away from the NATO proxy war. And the New York Times story quotes a... Um, a, uh, a Ukrainian military official um, saying, quote, Ukraine and Israel are in the same trench. Um, and, and quotes from Zelensky that not exactly the same thing, but going a little bit in that direction. And uh, so, so I think there's sort of like two sides to this. One is that Ukraine wants to very much associate with Israel uh, in their... Uh, um, supposed what they call the war against Hamas, but of course is mostly a war against Palestinians. And there's also some concern 
in you, this is going to lead to less uh, uh, support to the to the Ukrainians from the Ukrainian government. Now, Joe Biden, <clears throat> I guess, partly to alleviate this and partly for political dynamics, uh, political reasons, he has asked the U.S. Congress, uh, I guess, and Senate for a hundred and five billion dollars to arm Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and also for, I guess, uh, mili further militarizing the border uh, with Mexico. And so Biden has made a calculation that the dissent within the Republican Party over funding the NATO proxy war, those forces in Congress, principally, who were against or ambivalent around that, that those are some of the most pro-Israel forces. And so to package all this together uh, will lead to a, and also they're also often very hawkish on Taiwan. So the idea is you can get through the Ukraine funding that you might not have been able to do otherwise by connecting it to Israel and border, so-called border security in the South. And, um, and basically, I mean, I don't know, but like, you know, let's light the whole world on fire is really where they're going with this. I mean, let's get, let's push to, let's get it, let's get it going in, in, in Ukraine. Let's get it going in, in, in Middle East. Let's get it going in, you know, Taiwan and Asia. Um, that seems to be where the, uh, the thinking, <laughs> if you want to call it that, is, uh, is coming from, from uh, the people running the, uh, the U.S. empire right now. And so that gets into the discussion about uh, uh, the uh, uh, Israel's genocidal policies in Gaza. Um, and there's a lot to discuss on that front. I, I'll touch on a few elements. First of all, uh, we see things like the United Jewish Appeal, Toronto. Uh, they're already talking about how they raised more than $50 million for a special appeal for Israel. Now, Israel, of course, has a GDP per capita equivalent to Canada's. And I think they said that was in the first five days. So it very well could be, you know, towards 100 million at this point. And um, this is not new. This happens every time Israel's engaged in high profile violence. It goes back to 67, 73, 2006 with Lebanon, 2014, 2009. Uh, this time, there are, of course, more Israelis that died. Uh, but in previous times, even when it was almost one directional, the, the violence, United Jewish Appeal of Toronto, which is a registered Canadian charity, uh, raises large amounts of money that they send uh, uh, subsidized by Canadian taxpayers to Israel. The N National Post had a front page piece titled Ottawa Man Departs Canada to Join IDF Against Hamas Terrorists. And... Um, this is a guy who apparently back in 2006, I think they said also, he went, he, you know, returned to, to Israel to go fight and he's doing it again. And um, a number of stories, I've seen one La Presse story, I think they, about uh, some of what's going on. It was at least two, might've been three uh, Canadians who were in the IDF that they quoted, right? So we know that we don't know exactly how many, but around a hundred, sometimes a couple hundred, uh, uh, Canadians that are seem to be in the IDF at Israeli military at any one time. There's um, a, a post online based upon a, a, a message from a, the Canadian military official. So Canada, of course, organized some <clears throat> military planes to take people out of, of, um, of uh, I guess, probably from uh, Tel Aviv airport. And, um, and what the story said, or the comment said and what this post on twitter from a pro-israel source so i'm not a hundred percent sure this is correct but probably is they quote the canadian military they, they have a video clip of the Canadian military guy saying explaining what's going on that the israel asked them to, because there were jets going in from athens to tel aviv to, to also take israelis back to israel and so what the post said is that, that and i think it's like 30 uh, that these are actually Israeli military reservists who want to go back to get involved in the fight. Um, the Foreign Enlistment Act says you're not allowed to induce 
uh, Canadians. I don't know if these are I, I, they probably were Israelis, so I'm not sure if they're Canadians. But but they it's a it's a definite whether it violates the Foreign Enlistment Act or not. It's definitely a questionable uh, uh, morality of the Canadian military to be ferrying uh, IDF reservists back into the country who are probably going to be killing people in in Gaza uh, in in the coming days, if not already. Uh, on the uh, domestic front, lots and lots of different developments. Is the, the, obviously, the issue is really uh, uh, lively. Uh, you got things like Nova Scotia, the NDP Liberals and the uh, PCs in Nova Scotia uh, unanimously backed a motion supporting Israel a couple of days ago. You have a big political battle here in Montreal around the English school board putting out this statement, a very pro, very pro Israel statement. There's some pushback to that. You have uh, York University doing this incredible threat against the student unions, three different student unions um, who, that signed this statement <clears throat> uh, in solidarity with Palestinians uh, that uh, got a huge uh, uproar in right wing media. And, um, and the York University is basically trying to um, threaten all these students, but it seems like trying to disband the whole union if they don't apologize within a week and rescind the statement. Um, I, it, it seems it would like it would contravene the law in terms of um, uh, student union autonomy, uh, but I think there's going to be probably a big political battle on that, political and legal battle on that front. Similar, not quite as extreme at McGill. You have that McGill administration condemning this, the, the students to, for Palestinian solidarity for Palestinian rights. Um, in Ottawa, you had a. Uh, uh, a principal at an elementary school uh, tell a student that having the Palestinian flag in his profile picture, <clears throat> he had to remove it, to, quote, to keep all students feeling safe, welcome, and included in our classrooms. And <clears throat> the principal going after the student, which I, I'm not sure is a grade six, grade seven, grade five, I assume it's a bit of an older elementary school student. Um, the student, it's all, it's captured on video according to the CBC report. And the student pushes back saying, I don't feel, by you telling me I can't have a Palestinian flag, I don't feel very welcome. The, the principal has subsequently uh, backed off. Uh, the Israeli uh, ambassador in Canada on Friday was quoted in Canadian press, uh, basically pushing this line of, of trying to uh, label the pro-Palestinian demonstrations as uh, terror supporting. And there's a push by some of the right wing uh, media forces to to uh, basically uh, enhance the the legislation around um, uh, support for terror organizations, being that if you were to like, say something at a demonstration that could be construed as somehow supporting Hamas by, I guess, by saying something like uh, Palestinians have a right to resistance, <clears throat> that theoretically could be then if this if legislation was strengthened this way, that it could be uh, deemed as uh, uh, terror supporting, and the is Israeli ambassador weighed in uh, on the matter, um, basically uh, pushing this this angle. That of course is not considered uh, foreign interference. If it was the Chinese ambassador, I could tell you that would be considered foreign interference, but it's not because this is the Israeli ambassador. Now. Part of the reason this is all happening, of course, is because there are massive demonstrations, right? <laughs> uh, here yesterday in Montreal, there was, uh, despite intense rain all day, uh, the, I think the coldest day of the so far this fall, there was probably the biggest pro palestinian demonstration I've ever seen in Montreal and, and anywhere in Canada. Um, at least 10,000, could have been as many as 20. and. Uh, and that's after a number of others. There was one on Tuesday night uh, that was multiple thousands, called in the three hours, uh, multiple thousands for that. Uh, there was um, another one that was over a thousand or around a thousand on Friday afternoon. Um, <clears throat> lots and lots uh, going on in other cities, big demonstrations as well. I'm seeing reports on. And um, uh, Justin Trudeau got uh, run out of a mosque in Toronto on a Friday. He was booed out 
and uh, the 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 organizer was is viewed a video trying to calm people's uh, reaction, and then there's people outside uh, with placards uh, around Palestinian rights uh, booing him, and then Trudeau sort of tries to kind of brush it off. Um, that led then to another mosque that was supposed to be having a uh, international trade minister, uh, uh, Mary uh, Ng. Um, she canceled, they canceled her event. And, um, and uh, in fact, another cancellation uh, today, the NDP uh, leader, Ontario NDP leader, uh, Styles. Uh, she canceled a event she was supposed to be at for Islamic Heritage Month, I believe. Um, after, of course, uh, people have probably heard about this, that the uh, Sarah Jama, the uh, MPP for new MPP for Hamilton, who has been hounded by the uh, apartheid lobby since before she even became uh, an MPP, about I think about nine months ago, 10, uh, sort of last year, maybe, um, maybe March, April, something like that. Um, she, she, uh, sort of this year, should I say, uh, she, um, uh, she got kicked out of caucus. Uh, she put a statement out a couple of days after Hamas's operation where, uh, she called for a ceasefire where she rooted the violence in in um, in Palestinian dispossession, and the Conservative Party in Ontario has been going after her, and has been um, has been uh, has been uh, tried to censure her. And she put out she had read a statement today in the Ontario Legislature. It's quite a good statement, considering uh, calling Israel apartheid, doubling down, reiterating, and call for a ceasefire. And uh, and so she's been kicked out of the NDP uh, uh, caucus which is really outrageous. And um, this is uh, uh, Steve Pakin, the, uh, the, uh, the well-known journalist uh, for TVO, TV Ontario. He had a piece five or six days ago where he goes at uh, Sarah Jama, and this is a sort of, he's sort of a liberalish type, and uh, Pakin, um, widely esteemed in the in the establishment, and and he he goes at Jama and the NDP around Palestine, and one of the things he points out in the article, he says, uh, first, she is married to a Palestinian, and therefore generally feels the hurt of that community all the time, and so basically saying that Jama's. Uh, standing up against genocide is because she's married to a Palestinian, which I don't, you know, I don't doubt that may contribute to it. Now, if if someone was to say that Bob Ray, part of why he's a fanatic anti-Palestinian is because he's married to a Jewish woman. And in fact, in Bob Ray's case, a former head of, of uh, the Canadian Jewish Congress, or at least a board member, not the head, but somebody who was deeply involved in both establishment uh, a Jewish organization and, quite frankly, an apartheid lobby organization. If someone was to say that, Steve Pakin would not think that was really cool. Uh, um, but it's fine uh, to say that about uh, about about Jama. In fact, Pakin may even accuse someone of being uh, anti-Semitic for for saying that about Bob Ray's um, uh, wife. Uh, there's actually big controversy over that in the. 2004, 2006 uh, Liberal Party uh, uh, convention when some um, some uh, people were campaigning against Bob Ray uh, on the grounds that his wife um, had been a supporter of the Jewish National Fund, the explicitly racist uh, colonial uh, uh, charity. Uh, so the that's uh, a part to uh, uh, this. There's a there's a uh, um, Anthony Coach, who's a CB Conservative Party uh, official um, strategist, I think, uh, uh, was on CBC regularly until recently. He's tweeted he tweeted today or uh, yeah, sorry, yesterday, and he said, "quote <clears throat> in his tweet, 
If you want to have a serious conversation about anti-Semitism in this country, it means openly confronting and tackling the taboo of Muslim anti-Semitism and just how ingrained and latent it is both here and abroad. So he's basically saying that, that you know, Canadian Muslims are the source of anti-Semitism. And if you look at a lot, a lot of the stuff on Twitter, all kinds of people uh, show images of pro-Palestinian demonstrations and basically, um, you know, suggest that it's these, these Muslim brown immigrants that have, uh, uh, are, are having these, what they frame as outbursts of, of, of anti, anti, anti-Semitism. And um, on, the, on the note of, of that, the sort of manufacturing of, of, um, of the stick to beat uh, Palestinians, we had this really egregious example of that the uh, last couple of days after there was a protest held at Christian Freeland's office in Toronto. Okay, so you can go on my Twitter. It's a picture of Christian Freeland. It's really bold. It's protest at Christian Freeland's office. Uh, in fact, it's kind of embarrassingly focused at protest at Freeland's office. Now, Freeland's office happens to be across the street from the Miles Natal. Uh, Jewish Community Center in Toronto. And uh, at this protest on Friday, there is, there's like, they put babies, bodies of babies in front of Freeland's office. There's this instance, you can see images of it. There's an instance where a guy with an Israeli flag comes right in front of Freeland's office. And then the police intervene between the people he's trying to provoke and the dude with the Israeli flag. So it's clear it's all happening in front of, Freeland's office. I mean, it's clear of the promotion. And then there's all these images from the protest. Somebody, apparently, from the, the Jewish Community Center, according to the Canada Files report, comes out of the Community Center. At some point, the protest kind of spills, as it grows, it spills into the intersection. Uh, and somebody comes out of the Jewish Community Center and says, why are you protesting? Goes into some rant about protesting in the Jewish Community Center. And, and, um, and so then somebody posts this images of this video of this saying they're this is you know mask off they're protesting the Jewish community center uh, they're not just against Israel they're against the Jewish community center and 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 they post this and then all these people respond by like look at a map dude it's the protest was called from Christian Freeland's office the the center's right across from it and apparently according to people online the initial poster actually takes the post down. In, after they're embarrassed, but this group Canada, uh, Canada for Israel, or Canada Friends of Israel, something like that, takes up takes it up, and it's all over the media, all over social media today. In the Toronto Star, uh, Rosie Damano references it. I think I saw another reference in the National Post piece, uh, some other uh, corporate outlet. And and so, again, this is not I've I've you know I've experienced this for tw- over twenty years since I was at the Concordia Student Union in two thousand two. These these either wild distortions or complete fabrications from uh, Zionists to frame what something happened as they're the victim, all part of trying to enable uh, Israeli apartheid. So th- this is not this is not anything uh, you know new. I, I mean, I've personally been involved in or seen or, or witnessed dozens of examples of this. Now, what I got thinking about though in all this is 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 the the gaslight, right? The sort of psychological side to this. The people who are the ones crying loudest about this is just a, 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 um, a Jewish community center. It's not about Israel. The people cry, yelling the loudest about them, making that point, claiming that point, are the ones that know better than anyone that, in fact, <laughs> the Miles Nato Community Center is, Jewish Community Center, is deeply integrated in anti Palestinianism. Right. First of all, its source of funding, central source of funding, is Yuja Toronto. Yuja Toronto is the overseer of the Sija. Yuja Toronto is raises money for Israel every year. Yuja Toronto organizes the Walk for Israel. Yuja Toronto has a program of bringing Israelis and putting them into community centers and schools and living with Jewish uh, Torontonians. And Yuja Toronto is clearly well. It, it is the most important apartheid lobby organization in the whole country. 
the Miles and Adel, I quick search of their site. They talk about a bunch of these tweets about, oh, it's a kindergarten. They have, a, they, were, they have an elementary school. How dare you protest the elementary school? I go on the site, in like in two minutes, 30 seconds, there's three photos of this uh, elementary school on the site. What does one of the photos have? It has a bunch of five-year, six-year, or seven-year-olds, I don't know exactly, sitting in a class with the flag of what country behind them? The Israeli flag. Uh, we all know this school is indoctrinating these five, six, seven-year-olds in Zionist anti-Palestinian thinking. Miles Nadel himself, the, the, the organizer, was on the board of the, of the Jewish Community Center. He is a staunch anti-Palestinian. I punch his name into Google for, I search for a, a minute and a half. He funds a big project with the Jewish National Fund at Canada Park in Israel, which is built on the remnants of three Palestinian villages. Uh, if you look a link, they link very prominent to Yuja Toronto on their site. They link prominent to the JCCs of North America. You go to click on the link of JCCs North America. What do they focus on? Right at the top, all these pro-Israel stories. So the idea, and, and this is somebody who's, you know, I've never been to the Miles Nadal community and I don't know the ins and outs of what goes on, or they have they have an Israel Connection program at the Miles Nadal. Quick search on the site, Israel Connection program. I don't go there. I've never been there. I don't know the ins and outs. I guarantee you, I am just, just, just scratching the surface of the pro-Israelism that goes on at this community center. So the people who leave the community center and go off on a big rant about how dare you protest this. It's only about the Jewish community. It has nothing to do with Israel. These people are gaslighting at a level that's off the charts. They are trying to make the, 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 those who are protesting the colonization and oppression, the Palestinians and their allies that are protesting this, this colonization and oppression, they're making trying to make them feel like they are the oppressors um, when, in fact, it's quite, quite, uh, quite different. And they know full well, they know full well that the JCC is integrated, uh, tied into a whole network of anti-Palestinian uh, organizations in, in, um, in, in Toronto. At a bigger picture level, um, Bob Ray, Canada's ambassador, uh, a couple of days ago in a speech, he is quoted saying that Hamas, quote, has to be destroyed. Okay, so whatever that means, I don't know exactly what that means, but that, that's the rhetoric coming out of the Israeli government, which means basically genocide against Palestinians in Gaza. That's what it means effectively to destroy Hamas. That's what Canada's ambassador is saying. So very bellicose language. Um, the 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 uh, um, Trudeau yesterday uh, had a meet, had a a call with the leaders of the U.S., France, Germany, U.K., Italy to reiterate their support for Israel's quote right to defend itself. They, all, they always say a right to defend itself under international law or whatever, as, as Israel, of course, is violating international law. I mean, they've been violating for decades and decades, but violating in so many different ways uh, the, the laws of war right now. Um, so even as five or over 5,000 Palestinians killed in Gaza in the, the last two weeks, even as more than 5,000, more than 2,000 children about 100 in the West Bank now, we're up to about 100 Palestinians killed in the West Bank over the last two weeks, 17 days, whatever it is. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, they're reiterating this right to defend itself. Uh, so where that right to defend itself, is that 10,000, is that 20,000, is that 50,000, is half a million? Where that right to defend itself ends, I'm not sure. But if you're talking about destroying Hamas, you're probably talking about certainly 25 thousand plus killed Palestinians, but possibly uh, uh, more than that. Um, we should also mention that right now, Israel is just yesterday, they bombed the Aleppo airport and the Damascus airport as well. Uh, I think that would be in violation of international law. Um, now, there are some splits taking place simultaneously. We are seeing some splits. We have uh, 33 MPs mostly liberal, some NDP Greens that are calling for a ceasefire. In La Presse, there's a, La Presse just published a story a couple hours ago saying, quoting Melanie Jolie, saying, we're not calling for a ceasefire yet, uh, explicitly rejecting the, the letter that was calling for the government to call for a ceasefire. 
So there are splits happening, as one story put it. Trudeau grapples with divided liberal caucus on Israel-Hamas war. Uh, Jagmeet Singh did say in the House of Commons that we're seeing the, the seeds of genocide uh, in Gaza. Uh, so that's rhetoric that uh, flipped out some of the, the pro-Israel forces. Didn't get much media attention, but it was probably designed uh, to, to uh, blunt the criticism of, of him participating in the uh, sieges, uh, sieges pro-genocide uh, uh, rally in Ottawa last week. Um, and so there are some uh, there are some there's some some softening of language in some ways by Trudeau, but also simultaneously uh, reiterating their their point. It's clearly developed some serious uh, geopolitical uh, uh, dynamics going on. So Trudeau had a had a, a call with the uh, uh, Saudi Crown Prince, um, uh, MBS, and uh, which is interesting. Apparently Trudeau instigated that. So I'm not sure if that's about um, trying to press them to continue with the normalization. I doubt that's going to be happening. Uh, um, but um, uh, Dimitri Lascaris, in a tweet, pointed out some of the differences between what the Saudi crown prince said and what Trudeau said in, in their readout afterwards. And Trudeau, uh, Lascaris said, quote, Saudi expressed opposition to, quote, forced displacement of Palestinians from Gaza. Trudeau said nothing about this. Uh, Saudi... Uh, said the quote blockade must be lifted. Trudeau only refers to humanitarian access to affected areas. Saudi said all possible efforts must be made to de-escalate and prevent and quote prevent the expansion of violence. Trudeau only said that the two discussed efforts to towards de-escalation uh, to prevent further deaths of innocent civilians. Um, so we see that you see it in so many different ways. The rhetoric. Uh, of the of the Trudeau government is is very permissible of already wild level of 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 uh, war crimes by the Israeli government. Obviously, again, more than five thousand killed. Today, I did an interview um, on press TV, and the person before well, kind of with me was the press TV correspondent in Gaza. And the guys just started talking about just his personal experience. You know, he put he, he, the number. He's talked about something like 50 family members that had, had died already. But he just told a story about like the really close uh, effect on him was that the that earlier today, um, his son <laughs> called him and said that the building next door had been blown up and that a body part had actually flown into their uh, place. And he was like, don't, dad, don't worry, don't worry. Our, our, our situation is fine. Apparently the, the building next door, it was his wife's cousins. Six of them were killed. And he's just started talking about like his 13 year old, who he said has now been through four or five of these uh, Israeli onslaughts. And he said that his 13 year old just doesn't flinch. He just, just bombing. He's just like, keeps going on whatever his tablet or whatever he's doing. He just goes. And he said the same thing with his nine, nine month old uh, granddaughter who doesn't, who thinks the bombing is like, I don't know, celebrations or it's nothing. It's, and then, but then conversely, he said he talks about his older kids who are just totally traumatized, totally different reaction to it all than the, than the 13 year old and, 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 and little baby. And this is this is this is what this is what's happening. It, it's 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 just unbelievable. This level of 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 horror being uh, inflicted on a population that's been, you know, dispossessed, brutalized for decades and decades and decades, and it's all happening. It's very easy to see, uh, you know, the images. Uh, it's all out there, and our political establishment is backing this. And in fact, when an MPP calls for a ceasefire, <laughs> calls for a ceasefire, and, and says that this violence is rooted in the apartheid that all of the main establishment Western or human rights groups have said Israel's committing, when they do that, they get kicked out of the NDP caucus. Um, that's where we're at. Um, I went on for way too long. 
Uh, I will uh, make uh, Laura a uh, co-host, um, if I can here, let's see. And uh, I guess as I'm doing, I'll just go ahead, uh, go ahead, Hans. I think I uh, unmuted you. Well, I'd like to compliment and compliment your report. <laughs> Difference in spelling. Uh, while Sarah Jama got censored, unfortunately, by Merritt Stiles, I'd like to point out that six prominent NDP MPs, Nikki Ashton, Alex Bullis, uh, Leah Kazan, Matthew Green, Peter Julian, Lindsay Matheson, these are all senior members in the caucus. They all dissented and underwrote the letter. I think uh, the numbers speak very clearly. Elizabeth May signed it, and my own MP, uh, Nathan Erskine Smith, who is uh, jeopardizing his provincial leadership run by doing so, had the courage to speak out. Uh, to me, the Washington consensus is falling apart. And I read a report that even two thirds of Americans polled are calling for a ceasefire. My day today started very early, and at 8 a.m., I was privileged to join a Jewish organization organized uh, sit-in at the country's busiest intersection at Young and Bloor. We held that intersection in a completely orderly manner. We had uh, the privilege of Rabbi uh, David Mevaser uh make a prayer and ending with the, uh, the call for peace with the shofar uh it was a situation that one could not have imagined being possible only a couple of weeks ago um we um we are seeing the Washington consensus falling apart, and we're seeing tectonic shifts, shifts, shifts in the in the global balance of power. I ended the morning by uh, visiting the Ontario Legislature Gallery, and together with David uh, Mivasayer and Barry Wiseletter, we were escorted out after repeatedly shouting for a ceasefire from the gallery so i took a leaf from your uh activism uh eve and uh, proudly so rest my case thank you thank you hans eve do you have anything to reply i mean i, I agree with some part of the i think there is some serious geopolitical uh shifts taking place um you know, I would certainly prefer that could happen without thousands and thousands being slaughtered in Gaza. Yeah. Okay. Larry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just have a question. Uh, like, what sort of justification are they giving, like, the NDP in Ontario for kicking Jama out? Uh, I, I haven't really gotten a clear impression, like, from mainstream media, but you know what sort of content you get there um i'm just wondering uh Eves, if you have any information about that yeah styles put out a little statement short statement saying that basically trying to frame it as a jama broke an agreement that we're we're, we're fine with having dis differing opinions on different issues within the caucus but we had come to some sort of agreement uh about jama updating styles whenever I don't know what they don't it doesn't get into the details and that JAMA had broken that and also that it led to like toxic culture and that it was sort of like I forget the exact wording but like staff had been abused or something kind of hinting at that type of that type of uh framing I you know I <laughs> I'm you know totally prepared to believe amidst this 
brouhaha. There are, you know, somebody in Jamma's office or Jamma's or Jamma herself or whatever said something that was aggressive to somebody. You know, like I'm totally prepared to believe that I'm, this is all about the politics, of course. This, this is not about like whatever, uh, you know, and, uh, and, but of course, Styles can't say that, um, that this is because we don't want to be out front in saying that Palestinians are human beings. Uh, that would be, um, that would be uh, not a, you know, a good look, at least with the, uh, the left of the, uh, of the NDP. I think it would probably, uh, you know, she get, she get applauded uh, by the, Toronto Sun, if uh, if she said that um, you know we can't we can't have anyone in our caucus that believes that Palestinians are human beings, that would probably get some applause from uh, Sija and the Toronto Sun, but but it's um, not a good sell for the, uh, the base of the NDP. Hey, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I I have a question. I don't. I am just because you've been you've been mulling this over intellectually for a long time, but. Right now, we're seeing all the fascism in Canada and in our parties, there, there is not one party, I don't know, maybe the Communist Party, I haven't, don't, I haven't got anything from them in the last little while. I usually get something about whatever. And uh, about these incredulous things happening in Canada, as if it was normal for people to behave like this. Now, this has happened since before COVID, it's really come to a fore, but I'm, is there not something in our constitution or like, uh, like the party leaders speaking the way they are is very fascist and, and banning people. So when this, when, however this does end, none of our political parties are going to be legitimate. So they can't say, well, we made a mistake. They can't do that because they deliberately followed like a bunch of sheep, what the Americans are doing. And so like when they had that Nazi guy in the parliament, and I mean, it is just like, it's right there. So it's actually illegal what's been going on. So this is the only thing like after uh, they can't even have an election because not there is no credibility in any way. And I don't think the Canadian public is, until the, uh, the way we vote changes, really is fanatical about voting anymore. So I'm- Well, I'm I think that there's no doubt. I think that what, the, what happened today with expelling JAMA is going to clearly um, turn off a lot of particularly younger uh, racialized um, communities activists uh from having any, anything to do with the NDP and probably even from from voting period uh that's almost certain uh you know at the legal level I, I think that like if you look at what go, what goes on uh certainly in you know recent weeks you know what there is this push to change legislation to you know because in France and in Germany they have banned I don't know you know the, the legalese of it but they have banned Palestine solidarity demonstrations, right? They have simply made them illegal. They have legislation that, you know, again, I don't know the wording, but they can frame that this is in some way pro Hamas or pro terror or something like that. There is a push to have that legislation uh, adopted in Canada. One of the stories uh, I saw talked, I think they quoted, it was Peter McKay, who was then in the Harper government whenever they brought the current legislation in, and I guess at some point there was some discussion about um, kind of uh, strengthening the language around providing any type of support to what is defined as a terror organization. And and basically McKay was quoted saying, well, we didn't do that because we it was viewed as too hard to get through. And there was some impetus, I, I don't remember what it was, that he kind of wanted to move this legislation forward. And, and sort of saying that, so doing that now is a possibility, uh, but it would, it's going to take a whole kind of legislative um, uh, process. Um, so I think that like, you know, like, you know, there was a guy fired, a, a pilot fired at um, Air Canada. Air Canada. And, um, 
you know, I, I wouldn't at all, it wouldn't surprise me if Air Canada ends up having to pay the guy, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars because they broke the law. And I think the pilots are in a union at Air Canada. And, um, you know, so they, in that case, I think there's a decent chance you'll find some sort of redress. Uh, lots of cases you don't, you won't find redress, but, but, you know, for the, at the, at the legal level, like, you know, like Sarah Jama, um, I think part of why she might have got kicked out of the caucus is because she, she, um, she's launched a legal, uh, a defamation process against, uh, Doug Ford, the premier. And, um, he gave him, I think, gave him like a week to rescind the statement where she, it was really an incredible statement he put out that, you know, you're an anti-Semite that backs beheading of children and raping of women or something, basically something like that, that the premier put out uh, uh, targeting her. And uh, so she, I think, was, you know, right to to uh, launch this defamation. Um so, you know, I think, I, I think she'll probably would, she probably is, has pretty strong legal grounds. So I, I don't know that like the, um, you know, the illegality of what's happened is, is what would, isn't what I would kind of like uh, center. It's more of the broader kind of like cultural um, uh, dynamic, like um, Olivia Chow, just before I was looking on Twitter, Olivia Chow, the mayor of Toronto, put out a statement on Twitter three, four hours ago, uh, saying that <clears throat> denouncing the fact that there was a Jewish, as she framed it, a Jewish cafe uh, targeted. So at, at the demonstration in Toronto, I think on Saturday, um, the cafe name, I'm forgetting the name of the cafe uh, that I guess some point during the March, the speakers said boycott that cafe or something like that. And um, and it's being framed as, as like a Jewish cafe. But in fact, it's a cafe, of course, that was like, I saw a thread on Twitter explaining what the cafe had been involved in is like, like a really like tied into like the far right in Israel and this like security project. And, and, um, and so, you know, this is, this, it's more, I would say it's more at the level of the like political culture than it is necessarily at the level of, of, you know, breaking the law and the illegality and this kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, that, that, that can be, that's very effective though. Uh, a lot of people, I, I mean, a, f- a friend, you know, was the, his, his partner and children didn't go to the demonstration here in Mon- uh, Montreal, uh, the Friday ones. And I guess that's uh, nine days ago or something, 10 days ago. Uh, and, and basically, cause there was this whole, this whipped up kind of thing of this was, you know, terror supporting and the, the police were observing and, uh, all this kind of stuff. So it, it's effective in deterring uh, uh, protests, and and uh, and effective in 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 um, in uh, cowing people to sort of you know follow the the right line. Hey Laurel, you're up. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just I'm just stunned by the difficulty people seem to be having in distinguishing between Hamas. And Palestinians, I, I, uh, they, they seem to be thinking they're the same thing, and and they and Hamas represents the Palestinian people and is acting on behalf of the Palestinian people, but that does not mean that it's the same as the Palestinian people, and and I don't I don't I don't understand why Canadians can't get that difference. You know that 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 they that they should make a distinction between those two those those two entities, and and I know I know the news is not helping, but but that story that you told about the the the, the Palestinian man I believe it was a Palestinian man at when you talked at, at La Presse, and what he reported on what his family has been experiencing, we don't hear that we don't we don't learn that on the news we don't get that we just get we just get about Hamas. And I and I'm 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 puzzled by that. Why are they so bad at reporting this? Well, the simple answer is they're bad on reporting all foreign policy issues. That they you know the reporting is aligns with power. The uh, reporting aligns with with power. what the U.S. empire wants, and it's the same reason as as uh, as the NATO proxy war. And you know, like it's not about NATO. NATO has nothing to NATO expansion has nothing to do with what's going on in Ukraine. It's that's all just a big conspiracy. Every single U.S. military planner has 
you know, decade or all the prominent ones said NATO expansion is going to lead to a war. NATO expansion, but no, no, it has nothing to do with what's going on. So that's the big picture level. Like you get into more like micro level, you know, the Israel lobby is well, I mean, Honest Reporting Canada, the whole thing, all that Honest Reporting Canada does is intimidates media outlets from the lowest to the highest, from the Concordia, uh, uh, the Concordian, the student newspaper at, on the campus of Concordia, one of them, to the Globe and Mail. They design, if you publish something that we don't like on this issue, we send a letter, we do a formal complaint, we do an email campaign, we do, you know, they, they have a whole series of different ways, very well funded, and, it, and it's effective. Um, so, so the media is completely uh, uh, biased power. Now, the example I was talking about, that's not La Presse, that's Press TV, that's the Iranian state television. So if you go on Press TV in Al Jazeera, they have correspondents on the ground that are just, they're, they're detailing this, like, you know, live, right? It's, it's, it's happening. These people who live in Gaza and they, they're seeing it all around them. And, you know, like, but look at, look at the, look at the hospital bombing, right? The uh, Anglican hospital in Gaza and how that's been, that's been, you know, obvious. I mean, I go in 99% Israel. Israel did it. Right? It's almost certain that Israel did it. Right? It's yeah. almost certain. There's all kinds of reasons for why that's almost certain. I can get into all that. But look at how it's now reported. Yeah, it's, like it's, just, it's just based upon power. It's just based upon first source of power, the Israeli government. But more importantly, the US, uh, US president, the head of the empire, stamp of approval. And then the whole, and then now, now, so now Justin Trudeau is in a total bind. Okay. The US empire has said it. Now, how can you possibly go against that? <laughs> and so, so then the, so then Trudeau is like this sort of, they have to do this whole dancing game because he put out a tweet that kind of suggested, didn't state, but suggested that Israel was responsible and condemned it. And, uh, and so uh, you have to do this whole dance and they did a whole dance. And then the Canadian military intelligence puts out a statement. They do it late on a Saturday night. The Bill Blair, the, the new defense minister, who's the one who releases it, that confirms Canada has confirmed what the it's just all based upon. And now when you go out, you go onto Twitter and you and you deal with these like, you know, uh, Zionist uh, uh, apologists uh, and, and like they I mean, it's just it's just sourcing to power. That's it. It's just sourcing to power. It's just saying there is power behind this. It doesn't really make any sense right it, this story doesn't make any sense like israel's just been bumped like they 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 warn the they warn the hospital three days in a row beforehand they warn all of all of the area to get out uh they bombed that same hospital a couple of days before uh uh you can see al jazeera caught the image they were live it was they were live when the image goes in to the hospital <laughs> it certainly looks like a big uh, uh munition Palestinian Islamic Jihad doesn't have something that can kill that number. Uh, the Americans, <laughs> I mean, you said the clip with the American, the, 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 the official is asked, well, do you want to have an international investigation? The Americans said, no, no, we don't think that's necessary. I mean, the Americans don't have, they don't have, they don't have satellite. Israel doesn't have satellite. I would say they probably have satellite that can give us pretty close to proof one way or another. To my mind, unless the proof is literally like 100% that this was Palestinian Islamic Jihad, unless we, they get 100% proof it was Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the assumption has to be that it was Israel, right? Like, because all of the power is sourced against, uh, uh, you know, they have all the radar capacities, da 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 So... Anyways, but that's, you know, that's how, and the media just sort of goes along with it. It's like, you know, no, I don't think most, do most of these journalists actually think this is Palestinian Islamic Jihad? No, they don't, but they just go with it because it's, this is what power says. And that's how you survive in a world based upon power is to not go, go directly against it. Okay, Rupo, you're out. Yeah, but yeah. I, but Thank you. I, I uh, got my times wrong, so I came in late. But um, I've been sharing on Twitter 
um, the fact that um, I'm from the area that they called Biafra, and uh, there was a war in, it was a genocide, similar to what's happening right now. And Canada, US, and the rest of them all supported the, Niger the colonial government of Nigeria in its attempt to exterminate um, my ancestors, which they, they failed, obviously, because I'm still here. Um, and then I remember that when the indigenous peoples of this land that they stole resisted and resist, they also labeled terrorists. I also remember that Nelson Mandela was on the terrorist watch list for both Canada and the US. And so I remind people that the history of who this part of the world labels as terrorists seems, you know, we go, we, we push 20, 30 years later, and then they start celebrating that, those people as champions of justice and freedom. Um, now, to my understanding, um, Canada has signed the Geneva Convention, and so has the US. So this is genocide. Um, what Israel has admitted that it's doing and is about to do um, sounds like genocide to me when they say they want to basically go in and just get rid of innocent people because they say that they think that some people are hiding, hiding behind them. So I, I'm just, it, it, to me, it's, it, it's mind blowing that people believe this nonsense. I even had a guy in one of my um, tech discussion channels, we have a world news section, and they said that, you know, I just need to go to the IDF Twitter page to, to see confirmation on what's really going on in Palestine. And I, and I laughed and they thought I was laughing at genocide. And I said, no, I'm laughing at the fact that you're a computer scientist, you're supposed to deal with logic. And you honestly believe that IDF is a neutral, is a neutral party. So, so that's, I, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's still blowing my mind. How do we deal with this just blatant, like they're not even trying to hide it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I remember when they, when they did things in the past where they would pretend, but now they're just saying exactly what they're doing. So I, I don't get why our media are not covering, like the mainstream media anyway, are not covering this properly. This seems like low hanging fruit, um, just to ask serious, simple questions. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I agree, <laughs> you know, that there's, there's very little um, bringing together of all the different statements that Israeli officials have made that there, you know, there are no civilians in Gaza, the Israeli president, uh, we're gonna shut down all the, all the food and water and fuel uh until they until they give up well that's pretty clear collective punishment uh, uh we're going to depopulate you know part of half of gaza uh i mean all, all this stuff they're they're doing they're saying it openly but it's not little bits of it trickle into the dominant media um when it does trickle in it's also then framed as it's defensive it's all you know history started on october 7th and there wasn't a whole background to you know what hamas is and why hamas exists and and what hamas did uh that's tied to you know a whole history of dispossession um so it's it's just very much subservient to uh to power and if you if you were to like you know read the globe still now two weeks more than two weeks later there's as many stories that are about like the you know the horrible things that happened on october 7th is as there are stories about the the horrible things happening now you know like something like <clears throat> the hostages okay like free the hostages 212 and now i think the new number 20, 220 whatever it is exact number well you know that apparently over the past two weeks They've they've more than five thousand Palestinians have been detained in the West Bank, so it's doubled from a bit over five thousand. So we talk about free the hostages. These are you know like again like a Palestinian in the West Bank that's being taken by Israel. By any if you sit and think about this conflict, who who is who is like a, a bigger victim of the conflict? The Palestinian West Bank or the Israeli that was taken into Gaza, uh, you know, 17 days ago or 16 days ago. 
clearly the Palestinian is the bigger victim of the of the conflict because they're the ones who've been dispossessed and you know terrorized and land stolen, etc. Um, that doesn't mean that the, the the Israeli civilian that's being taken into Gaza is not also a victim in the, currently. But if you big picture, clearly it's the Palestinians. And and you know if if it's two hundred and twenty. Uh, hostages in Gaza and 5,000 uh, in, in, you know, new Palestinians have been detained. <laughs> Clearly the hostages, you know, it's about, uh, it's about, uh, what is that, uh, 25 to one or, or, or whatever. But you never hear about it. You hear a lot about the hostages, like in when Sarah Jama in uh, the Ontario legislature, when she's doing a speech today, somebody heckles her, presumably a conservative MPP, and said, what about the hostages, right? Well, if, you know, Ojama should have responded, yeah, what about the hostages? <laughs> but it this just doesn't even exist in our media. It's not even, the hostages, there's only one way. It's only one directional. It's only the Israeli um, uh, hostages. But, um, so yeah, it's, you know, and, and now, now I do think, I, I'm gonna say this, like, I think like I've seen media bias on a whole bunch of issues on foreign policy related issues. And, and, you know, we had one that only a month ago now, the whole Libya, right. The disaster in Libya and how they, they, they were, they were able to do like 10 minute stories on CBC about, about uh, how war had contributed to the, the uh, disaster. And then, but somehow forget that NATO bomb the hell out of the country uh 12 years ago okay so so you know i've seen some really wild that's a pretty extreme example some pretty wild stuff but now the palestine thing is a bit different than i would say with like haiti for instance where there's also some very wild uh uh um foreign policy omissions lies distortions whatever and in that i think most journalists like if you're if you've been at a daily newspaper, you're a sort of, um, you know, kind of follow international news. You know, you know, Palestinians are oppressed. Like this isn't this isn't sort of like like it's not like obscure or whatever. Like this is all you know. There's innumerable you know amnesty, innumerable human rights reports, groups. It's been going on for a long time. So, so they know, unlike, I think there are a lot of them really don't know that Canada's screwing over Haiti. I, I think that, you know, they, there's willful blindness, of course, but, but, but on the Palestine question, I don't actually think that's the case. I think that most people in, in this milieu know that Palestinians are being screwed over. Um, and yet still, right? So they cow, they cow to fear, they... They, you know. But. Okay, so we can we take one last question? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're quite, a, quite a ways past. So okay, so Aiden, go ahead. You're our last one. Thank you, thank you. Okay, give me a quick second. I'm gonna make sure my uh, the audio doesn't reverberate. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, it's yep. fine. Okay, great. Uh, so I'll speak a little uh, on the topic of you know Palestine, the Palestine liberation protests. I was uh, I've been I covered uh, I've covered a bunch of them recently for the. Can files in the the GTA area. I will say on the positive note, there's a lot of energy, and I would say there's um there's people that are being mobilized that frankly wouldn't be politically mobilized otherwise. Um, I also think uh, you know I was there in in Toronto, and um, funny enough, the Toronto Sun and some of the um the some of these right wing influencers actually picked up uh, the coverage that I did um of it because you had the police um pointing these uh you know the, the kind of the weapons at protesters on the top of the uh they were trying to get onto the onto the gardener um to repeat what the tamil protesters had done almost about a decade or so ago and what's you know, this all leads back to i think they're, they're quite desperate to get prevent them from getting onto the gardener right um and you know i think this leads into a broader thing of why is there such this heavy repression Right, because look, there's been horrific uh, acts, even genocides, such perpetrated by the West before, but there hasn't been this level of intimidation and repression around it. You know, um, realistically, uh, right? You know, 
I can't speak to the post 9-11 period as well, but I'm, I don't think in terms of the glorification of terrorism, et cetera, that was actually threatened in terms of outright criminalization in the same way. And maybe I'm wrong there, but my impression of things is that the reason why the West is collectively so desperate is because actually the uh, the Palestinian resistance and its uh, its major backers in uh, Iran uh, and uh, Hezbollah, and you have uh, Yemen's and Sralla, um, which is fighting against uh, the Saudi attempts to take over that country. Um, those are those are very strong forces. Uh, Hezbollah humiliated Israel in 2006. Um, and, uh, you know, Israel knows that Hezbollah, Hezbollah, Iran, you know, if they come in, the Israeli state is in deep trouble. It may not exist in a year from now. You know, so I think that's I think that's the thing of why it's so desperate here is because the solidarity here. And if people clock into that and realize who's actually backing the Palestinian resistance, they might start asking questions that people that our political elites really are absolutely desperate for people to not be not be answering. And I'm not saying you have to love Hezbollah. I'm not saying you have to love Iran in their domestic policy for sure. But look at the forces, uh, political forces, objectively and factually, and you'll see a very different picture. Um, and that that actually explains a lot more of this this desperation. There's actually very good reasons for the desperation on the side of the. Uh, of the imperialists, uh, in my view. Anyways, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Uh, oh, actually, you know what? Um, uh, Joel and Ten mentioned Iran. Um, in terms of, uh, it was IRGC because Israel had done some bombing. I think uh, it was they. Russia gave Israel uh, Iran permission actually to use one of the military bases to fire. Um, I think it was weapons from there actually. So, and Russia also really fascinatingly, they actually put out a statement. They were the only in terms of the Security Council and such. Um, they actually, their statement actually didn't condemn, didn't condemn Hamas, right? You know, like people can say what they want, to, you know, they may not like Russia, but you do have to look at that and acknowledge that it was Russia whose resolution wouldn't condemn Palestinian resistance, right? That most clearly showed it understood the Palestinian right to resistance. So anyways, curious for all the thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, well, I, first of all, I think Russia's not, I think Russia actually has, somewhat close relations with Israel. I think it's really complicated relations. Um, now, I do agree with you. I would go a little bit beyond um, the Iran-Hezbollah dynamic. I think that is part of it. But I, I do think that part of the tone of the kind of like uh, uh, framing now, or if you want to call it like this sort of just over-the-top pro-Israel kind of policy is that there, there is increasingly sort of a geopolitical kind of camp uh, developing. And so this gets does get tied into, I mean, Joe Biden is making it really explicit, whether it is exactly or not, that's, we could debate that a little bit, but he's making it really explicit. It's like, we want, we want money for Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan. And he's, you know, that's, that's a pretty uh, clear indication that it's being, framed in this sort of like a uh, global uh, US empire geopolitical ordering. Um, whether it is or not, I don't, I like whether that's completely, I think that's, uh, you know, um, no doubt. There's no doubt that Hezbollah is a far, far more potent military force than Hamas. And uh, Israel is, is, being uh restrained it's hard to believe <laughs> uh, but are being restrained partly by what's going on with hezbollah now israel has killed i, I think i saw 16 or 17 hezbollah fighters over the past uh two weeks or so, so there's there's not a it's not a full-fledged war going on there but there's some pretty serious kind of skirmishes going on and uh, and obviously that can 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 become something much much bigger fairly quickly, and that could lead to some serious uh, uh, damage all across uh, Israel. Um, and clearly, the Americans sending naval vessels there, and you know, munitions and plan for more than ten billion in weaponry and all that is designed in large part to deter uh, Hezbollah and to deter Iran and and the like. Um, but uh, 
yeah, I don't know. I don't know where where this all goes. And I also think it's still, I think there's, there's it's, you know, people have argued this and I think it, it makes a certain degree of sense to me that one of the things that, that Netanyahu wants in all of this is to draw, basically to draw the Americans into fighting Iran. And, um, and so you, I think the logic would go is that you escalate to such an incredible degree uh, in the killing in, in, in Gaza, that that leads to, I mean, we've seen some of it. We saw, I think the, the Houthis fired some rockets uh, towards Israel and the Americans intercepted it or something like that. And, um, and so then that escalates with Hezbollah and then you sort of escalate in a whole bunch of areas and you can try to draw the U.S. into in some sort of uh, open fight with uh, Iran. Um, I don't know if that's correct or not, but uh, I think that's at least something to, um, to, uh, to consider. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much, Ian. Thanks for everybody's good questions. So I think we'll close it now. Night all. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care.